Hey everyone, welcome to the first step about learning Unreal Engine 5 blueprints. Now in this video, I'm gonna be going over the basics of variables. So this is gonna take the assumption that you have little to no experience in game development or coding in general. So if you already know about variables, feel free to watch the other tutorials that are available. However, for this, this is gonna be the basics understanding and it will start you on the right path of learning about the building blocks of variables. Now, variables are the basics of all game logic and interactivity. Whether you're creating an adventure type game or a simple point and click game, no matter what, you're gonna be utilizing variables and they're going to set you on the right path for game development. Now let's get started to showing you the type of variables that are available. We're going to start with just the most common types. This is not going to be the only types of variables. However, it is going to be a starting block on understanding the basics. So let's get into it and show you in Unreal Engine 5 what it looks like and just to give you a clear view on what is what. Now let's go into the type of variables that are available. Don't feel overwhelmed by the descriptions. These will come in time and I'll be able to explain what is what. So in this uh, demo blueprint, I put down the most common variables that are shown in Unreal Engine that are utilized the most. Now, with these, I did include a little description for each of them. Just to kind of give a simple explanation of what is what, feel free to pause at any time to take a look and read them. They are just very generic to explain what type of variable it is. We'll also note that each variable that you see located here all have their own color. So if you look at the bottom left, we'll see where we have variables listed. We have a Boolean, a string, integer, float, vector, rotator, and transform. Now, these aren't the only variables that are available. There is a lot more. So if I was to actually include this plus button right here, we'll note that it takes me to the bottom. It allows me to create a new variable. However, if I click down this drop down, we'll now see that we have all of these available. So you'll see that I didn't include everything. And if you actually hit these drop downs, you'll see that you now get a significantly more amount of variables that are available. Now, note you're not gonna be using every single one. Some of these will just appear when you need them. You may not actually touch all of them. You'll touch some of them, but nonetheless, there is a lot that is available, but we're gonna just start off with the basics. Let's not get overwhelmed, and let's just start with the Boolean variable. So a Boolean variable is a very simple yes or no question. It's a typical true or false variable. What it does is it will tell you if something is either true or false. So in my example here, is the door locked? Is that true or false? So if the door was in fact locked and we are asking if it's locked, then it would be in fact true. Now, if it is false, let's say the door is unlocked. So then the Boolean would say that it is false. So typically, if you had a Boolean variable, and let's say we needed to confirm that this is in fact locked. So if it's locked, this Boolean should be true. We would want to make sure that this is ticked on. This would tell us that the Boolean is now true. Now, if it is unlocked, we would want to make sure it's unchecked. So to confirm, unchecked means false, checked means true. Now, it doesn't mean you'll always select the set node here. However, it does let you know that you can manually check if this is either true or false. Now, let's say we set this as true. If we had the Boolean as true, Whenever you do the get node, this means you're only gonna pull what the variable currently contains. So in our code, if we ever set boolean to true, if we then call it later on, we'll contain what the current value is. So if we set this to true, that means later on when we do the get node, it will be true.
And to give you a clear definition of what a get and set node is, a get node will just read the value of the variable. So you're only taking what the variable currently contains. The set node means that you want to now change the value into something completely new. So you may want to alter it. Let's say um, for a Boolean, it's very simple between true and false. But if you were to use uh, numbers, let's say um, you had a value of five and you want to change it to four, you would do a set node and then you would change it to four. Now, you can't add numbers to Booleans. They're only true or false, but we have other variables that would contain numbers and we'll get into that in a bit. But to give you a clear definition between the two nodes, they're very useful and they're utilized very often. So let's now move on to the string variable. The string variable is essentially just a text form. This could be a message. It could be a name. It could be the title of your dialogue. It could be an item name that you'd want to pass along. Any type of text form that you want to pass along is generally going to be a string or you would convert other variables into a string. Now, Unreal Engine has a really great feature where it let me take this get note of a float. You don't really need to know what a float is yet, but what I'm going to do is if I actually plug this float into the string, we'll see that it says convert float to string. If we do that, we'll have this nice little convert value where it's going to take this float, which is a number value, and it makes it a string. It's very handy, and it allows you to print things into a text form. So even if we had a Boolean, what we could do is we can plug this into the string. What this does is it takes the value of the Boolean into a string value. This now would tell us that this string will equal true or false depending on the value. If we set it to true like we did over here, that means this string will now have the text of true. So it would be able to pass along values. It's extremely handy in all blueprints. So just keep in mind that text forms typically come in the string value, and you can also convert other things into strings. Now I'm going to delete these. Let's move on to the integer and the float. Now we're gonna kind of talk about these hand in hand because they're very important number values. Now an integer value, they are whole numbers only. They are used for essentially counting in whole amounts. So whether it is scoring points in a game, the number of inventory items you have, it could be anything from how many stars are in the sky, how many cookies are in the cookie jar. You're only gonna give whole numbers. There is no decimal points and no fractions of any sorts. You will only pass along the whole number. Whole numbers are like one, two, three, four, et cetera. No decimals, no fractions. Now, a float variable, unlike integers, consists of decimals. This allows for significant precision if you're wanting to calculate between time, speed, uh, if you wanna calculate the amount of damage you're gonna do, whether you're doing math that multiplies together, Typically, you want to be as precise as possible, and that way you would use floats. Integers don't really have that precision, so they're not really used in the sense for that, as well as you wouldn't really use a whole number for time because you're not gonna be able to calculate the seconds um, and things like that. So typically, floats are used for anything that requires uh, precision, and you wanna calculate uh, more accurately. Now, of course, out of all four of these variables we have talked about, we have the get node and the set node. You're going to have that for every variable. We haven't gone into any of these, but you know how they all have the get and they all have the set. 
So you'll be able to pull the value of any type of variable you have, and you can also set it to another value, depending on whatever you're gonna calculate. Now, you don't have to plug in just one thing into these floats, as well as for the strings, you don't have to just plug in one thing. So let me actually copy and paste these into a blank area. What you can do is let me pull out my integer as well. We're just gonna do very basic math. If we were to pull off this float, we'll now be able to see a list of everything we can now add. So this is gonna add a bunch of other nodes. Now I'm not gonna to go too in depth on nodes right now, but all you need to do is know that we have the ability to add, subtract basic math functionalities. So just by typing add, we'll be able to see that we have all of these add operations. Now under operators, this is the very generic add. So if you're wanting to do addition. Now we have a float which consists of decimal points and fractions. It, it's a number value. And for integer, we have whole numbers only, but we can actually plug this in directly. And you'll notice where it says promote to float to integer. So this is gonna actually change this to an integer. So we're able to add both of these number values together. It's not really common for coding languages to allow this. So that's what's really helpful here. And then we can actually plug this into the float. So what this does is we're taking the current value of float and adding the integer value and then putting it into float again. So we're combining these two and setting it. It's basic math um, that's available. Now, let's get rid of this and go back over here. The other thing I wanna point out is every variable has a default value. So if I select on Boolean here, we'll see default value on the right side. Now we'll see that for Boolean, we only have a checkbox and this is to show whether it is true or false. As you see, the tooltip is changing between false and true. For string, we can enter something here, enter anything. And that will now mean that this string values default will always be enter anything until we tell it otherwise. So if we started the game, this value will be enter anything. And then until we set this to anything else, like now let's add. Once we were to set this, now the, the value will become this. So just keep in mind, there's always a default value and there's always um, the ability to change it. Now for integers and floats, you have the same thing. You have a default. We'll notice that we have a period that is gonna separate between the decimal points. So we could do 10.74. And then for integer, you can only do seven. If you actually hover on top of the number value, you see how I have my arrow change. I can actually scroll this left and right, you'll also notice I can go into the negatives. So it does handle positive and negative numbers. So we can set that to like negative two. You can also do the same thing for floats for a positive and a negative. Another thing that you may have noticed that I'm doing this entire time is that whenever I make a change, I'm selecting the compile. Selecting compile will update the current blueprint you are using. And what it will do is it will check out of all the changes that you've made and make sure that the blueprint is good to go. So as you hover on top, it says good to go. If I was to ever do anything that didn't make sense and the blueprint would say, hey, this is wrong, this won't be a green check mark, it will actually be red. So just keep in mind on that. It's something that you would do very commonly. Once we go into nodes in a next video, then we'll be able to go in a little more about compiling. But just keep in mind, you wanna compile often. 
Next, we're gonna go into the vector variable. Oh, it looks like I misspelled something here. So let's do rotator. All right. Now for vectors, they are essentially three different values in a 3D space. Now they can be utilized for a lot of things. Typically, you can calculate based upon the location of something or the find the distance between two points, such as like how far is something from you or which direction should you go. So they're very crucial when it comes to moving characters as well as finding locations of objects or wanting to set a new location of an object. Now, we have a X, Y, and Z. So this actually relates to in the world. So if we went over to our third person map, at the very bottom left, you may not be able to see well, but if you're in Unreal Engine, you'll notice how we have a X, Y, and Z. So if I actually turn my camera, you'll now see the directions they are pointing at. I can't zoom it in further, but if you look there, you'll see the X, Y, and Z of the world. So the X, Y, and Z refers to the 3D space. The Z axis is typically up and down. X is, um, I believe, front and back, and then Y is left, right. So um, in a 3D world, and not X and Y necessarily don't have to be front, back, left, right. Um, they could be really anything, but it do they do point in their own direction in um, a cross-compatible way. So if we actually select it on this box, we'll notice that we see this. And now you'll see the color. This is blue. You can't see it too well because this box is also blue. But we'll also see X which is this red line. And then we have this green line, which is Y. If we actually held down this arrow, we would be moving in the X axis. If we held down the Y one, we move through there. And then we can do the same with Z. Now, this is just to explain between what an X, Y, and Z is. They have multiple uses and can be used in a variety of different ways. Now, I hope that gives you kind of an example of that. Now, if we went back into this variable of a vector, if we copy and paste this over here, another thing to note that is very important is you have the ability to split the struct pin. Now, if we hit split, what this does is it breaks down each into their individual parts. Now, one thing with vectors is that Typically, you can plug a vector into a vector. So if you have a precise location or scale or whatever type of X, Y, Z that you want to plug into, you can do that. Now, let's say you only wanted to plug in the X and the Y. So if you had this, and let's say you had an X and a Y over here, and you wanted to plug these in, if you did this, you can only put in one value. So if I plug this in, I'm not able to actually provide the X and the Y. I'm only providing X right now. So you'd want to split this and plug these in. So let's say I wanted to not plug in the Z axis and I wanted to put in my own value. So I put 500. So now I have a new vector that has the X, Y, as well as a brand new Z access that maybe I calculated something totally different that I wanted to provide. So that's very key to make note as well. And then you also have the ability to recombine it as well if you didn't want to. And you'll also notice the value I entered in is still there. So just make note that you do have that available there. Also, now that I deleted my variable, we'll know that my vector is gone. So let's bring this back into here. What you'll do is under variables on the bottom left or whatever you may have your my blueprint located. You can click on vector, hold it and drag it into the world. Once you let go, 
you'll now see you have the get vector and you have the set vector. So if I do get vector, now I have it back. If I was to do this again, we'll now know I have the set node. So very important that you know how to drag in a get and set node. Another thing to note that we won't go into in depth here, but if you were to left click the vector or right click, I believe, uh, for those that are right handed, uh, I'm left handed. So my controls are typically uh, inverted, but nonetheless, the opposite of your normal click button. Oop, let's select on here. Um, oh, sorry. Let me delete that and actually. Actually, scratch that. We won't go into that. I was going to show a different functionality, but we'll go into that with nodes right at a later time. So now let's go into the rotator variable. For a rotator variable, this is essentially just the rotation of an object. This allows you to control different type of angles. Maybe you want to turn your character or turn an object. So for this, you also have the X, Y, and Z. So if I went back into the world over here, we'll see how I'm still clicking on this cube. What I can do is over here, this allows me on the top right to select this rotate objects button or the hotkey E. So by pressing E, we'll now note that my arrows have now changed. So now, I still have the X, Y, and Z, but we'll see where Y is this one. So if I held this, I can turn it as such. And if I hit on the Z axis, I am turning left, right. And then if I hold down the X, we'll turn this way. So you do have the ability to rotate things. And it does help with a variety of different reasons on whatever you may be turning your character, turning an object, or maybe you're wanting something to um, maybe spin on its direction as it's floating to something. Whatever the reason may be, you have it available. So that also comes in the XYZ, and you also have the ability to split that as well. So you can control whether you want to turn the X, the Y, or maybe you just want to change just the Z axis, uh, the Z yaw. So they have different names, not exactly axis. You have X, which is the roll. You have Y, which is pitch. And you have Z, which is yaw. So very important. And you also have the ability to recombine it as well. Now, transform is a bit more, um, it provides a significantly more amount of information based on either the character or the object you're passing along. Now, a transform actually includes not only the location, so the vector of where they are in the world or um, whatever type of location it is, it also provides the rotation, so the way the object is facing, and the scale. So for the scale, if we went back into the world, we're going to go back over on the top right where we can select and scale objects or hotkey R. And we'll now see that this has changed once more. So you can also scale this as such, just like on the X, Y, and Z, and scale it as such. Another thing is if you actually click on the middle, you can scale all of it at once. Another thing to note is Control Z un, un, undoes uh, undoes everything. Uh, sorry, English stutter. Um, and then if you select on just the arrow that is between the both, you can scale on just those two. So very important to note on that as well. So there's scaling, there is moving the object, and then there is rotating the object. And then you have the ability just to select it. So you can select on each thing just to find info. Now let's go back over here. The thing with transform that is most useful is in fact the split struct. 
So you may not always want to provide the location, the rotation, and the scale. Maybe you want to leave the scale as is, but you want to be able to change the rotation and the location. So as such, if we were to split this, we could plug the location and the rotation, but we want to leave the scale. And we can leave it as is, just as we did for the vector. Another thing to note is that in transform, not only did, so let's recombine, not only can we split this, we can actually split it even further. So if we wanted to provide just a very specific location, so maybe we only wanted to plug in the Z, we can also plug in the rotation, and maybe we want to split the scale as well. So you can go even further and plug in just the scale of the Z and leave the rest. So you can go even further into splitting and break down the information you want to pass along. Or maybe you have different nodes that you want to plug in. So let's say, let's recombine this, recombined, and then let's recombine this as well. I'm gonna undo a lot of this. Okay, cool. We'll leave that as is. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my vector and then I'm gonna grab my rotator. So, or rotator, let's say I'm gonna plug this in. I wanna give that value. But for this vector, I wanna plug in just the Z and I want to leave the X and Y the same. And for my scale, let's say I had a secondary vector. So what I'm going to do is Control C and V. I have a brand new vector. And now I want to plug in this to be my scale. So now I have three different variables plugged into my transform. And then my transform will now have its brand new value that is set here. So transforms contain a lot of information and they help pass it along if you want to customize whatever it may be, whether it is the size of your character, changing the location and the rotation, it's very important. And it allows a lot of flexibility in what you want to provide. Very useful for controlling your object in the world. Now that does cover the very basics of variables and what they are capable of providing. Now, like I said, variables can come in a variety of different things. Your objects are variables themselves. So just like I made my blueprint here that is an example called BP Demo, I can also call this BP Demo and I can find this blueprint demo right here. And this is an object in itself. So let me change this type to single. We'll go into what single actually means in a bit, but let's pull this in here. So now this blueprint is an object reference. So all blueprints can be called and referenced as a variable. Just like we set a float, a rotator, a vector, a transform as such, all types of Blueprints of any kind can be called as an object reference. Essentially what that means is, let's say your character has a gun and we'll call that the, um, let's just call it an assault rifle. The player has an assault rifle and we wanna make sure that we can reference that assault rifle at all times. So whenever we want to call the assault rifle, we would have a blueprint or reference assault rifle that we would be able to call and it would reference that assault rifle whenever we needed to. So it's very important to know that you have the capabilities of setting variables that can set the assault rifle as this variable and then you can call it whenever you want. Variables are extremely helpful and they set how to control the flow of your blueprint. So let me delete that. The next thing we're going to go into 
is two other types of variables. So we have the array, and then we have a map. Now, everything I've shown you so far has been single variables. And what that means by single variables is they only contain one set of information and they change only that piece of information. So for example, this string here has a default value of enter anything. It only has one value. So if we were to set this value, we can only change that single value. However, for an array, it's not necessarily the same thing. So for that, in an array, you can have more than one value. Now, this is where a couple of things require um, referencing so that you can make sure you're always calling the correct value that you want. In an array, they have things called index. An index is a reference point to find that value. And also note that an array will always start from the value of zero. So it doesn't count like you normally would with like, let's say you're counting with your hands and you go one, two, three, four, five. For an array, it actually starts from zero. So instead of counting on your hands, it's gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five. The first index is always zero. So if you ever need the first value of an array ever, it's going to be zero. And you'll also notice that when I pull some type of nodes, now you may not know what nodes are yet, but you'll notice the default goes straight to zero. That is always gonna be the first value. Now you could go out of your way to always set the first value as one, but that's a lot more work and that's not really what most people do ever. So just keep in mind on that as well. Just get used to the fact that the first number is gonna be zero. Now for that, you're able to set as many array as you want. So I can add another element here by hitting that plus button and I can set something else like shark. So now zero will always reference apple. One will reference pi and now two will reference shark. Now things that you can do with arrays is these other common nodes that are used with an array. This get node that you see is kind of similar towards what you see with this get string. Now, what you would need to do is when you do a get node off an array string, you are gonna pull whatever index that you want. Now, an index is also an integer. It's a whole number that is referencing the index in the array. So if we did a whole number of one in this get node, this will pull pi. And where you see the output over here, this will then give us the output of pi. Now, if we change this to two, it'll do the same thing. It'll give us an output of shark. Find is very similar to the get node, except it's kind of the reverse. So let's say we had an array and we wanted to see if the array had shark. Now this array does have shark and what it would do is it would provide the number two. It would tell us that the index is two. Now, if we hover on top, it says if the index was found, we'll get the value of two. However, if it wasn't found, like if instead of shark, we were trying to find tree, the index would come as negative one. It would tell us that it's not found, so it does not exist. So that is also important if you're ever checking to see if a value exists inside of an array. The other thing to do is if you wanted to add an item to an array. So let's say we wanted to add tree. What this would do is it would take the array string. We would then want to add. So what we would do is we would add the next value. So the next value would be added, which would be three, and then it would add in tree. So we would just be adding one more value to there. And then it will also pop out the index 
integer. So this would now be the index of three. So let's go ahead and just re-delete that. And then we have set array element. What this does is this will actually set the specific index that you want to be the certain value you want. So if we want a tree, we can then set this as the index zero. What this would do is just like this set node, we would set index zero to tree. The other thing to know is size to fit. So if false, we won't actually set any array element if the index ever exceeds the amount of elements here. So let's say we had three elements like we do, but in the set array element, you wanted to set the index of four. What would happen is it actually would not go through because we don't have a four index. We only go up to two. So this would not fit. Now, the other thing is if we hit this to true, this will now set the index of the array string four to tree. So just keep in mind that you would need to have this toggled on or off depending on the purpose that you're wanting to set. So that's an array. Next, we're gonna go into maps. So maps are similar to arrays, except instead of index, you can actually set your index to any other type of variable. So if we hit on array string, we'll see how index zero, index one, index two. For my example here, I have a map of string. So instead of index, I actually have the value is apple and the value is pi. So I kind of made this in reverse. So instead of searching if we have an index, we are searching if we have an apple or if we have pi. So just like the get nodes that you see, we have the find. And what this would do is we would want to search, does pi exist here? And then it will show us the value if we did have pi, which is here. So this would actually provide the value of two right here. The other thing we could do is that it could be any other type of variable type. We could even just put in a Boolean. Now this will tell us, do you, are you sure you want to change? Let's change this. Let's hit the refresh node. Refresh all of these and we'll now show that these turned red. So now these are Boolean variables. What this would do now is that if we find pi, it'll then tell us whether, oops, let's compile, whether this is true or false. So if we found pi, it would tell us, okay, pi is true. Keys, what this does is it will pull out a list of the keys that are available in the map. And by that, the key is referring to apple and pie. So it will provide us a list of apple and pie. So this value will then give me an array consisting of these two values. Length is very simple. It simply tells us how many values are here. For apple and pie, we have two values. This will give us an integer value of two. The other thing is to check is contains. So contains is a little different than find. Find will actually provide you what the value of pi is. But if we wanted to just check if pi did exist, it's actually only gonna tell us, okay, did we find pi or did we not? So it's only gonna give us a Boolean of true or false. It'll tell us whether this map had pi or if it did not. So that is the very basics. Now there's a lot more things. So if we actually pulled this off and under where you see map, you'll notice that we have all these other type of nodes that are available. Now, again, not going too in depth into nodes right now, but 
The ones that I went over aren't the only ones that exist, but they are very useful and important and common nodes that are utilized. Now, that is the basics of variables, what the most common are and what an array and a map is. So these are just very generic basics. However, I hope that you've learned a lot off of this. If you enjoyed tutorials like this, feel free to hit the subscribe button. I have also um, shorts that I post common as well, as well as um, adding them to TikTok. However, just feel free to hit that subscribe button, join the Discord. I appreciate all of your support. For any feedback or recommendations of videos, feel free to reach out, comment, join the Discord, and thank you all for your time. And I hope you've learned a lot off of this video.